Nancy Mariana Mestre Vargas, was born in 1975 in the city of Barranquilla in Colombia. She was the daughter of Martin Mestre Yunis and Nancy Vargas Jaraba, and had an older brother whose name I couldn't find. In childhood, she was described as a cheerful, outgoing, and loving child. As a teenager, according to her friends, Nancy was a very happy, honest young woman who loved life. Still, according to them, her greatest quality was frankness. She was a direct person and what she had to say, she said without fear. Nancy was also very attached to her family. She considered her father an idol and her best friend. And her mother, she said, was her greatest teacher. She studied at the bilingual Marymount College, considered one of the best schools in the country, where students have an excellent education and already speak fluent English. Nancy had the dream of going to study in the United States. She really wanted to get to know the country and its culture. On December 31, 1993, the Master family was gathered at their house to celebrate the new year. The family had plans to go out to celebrate elsewhere, but they didn't because the eldest son had suffered an injury due to a football match and should rest. Nancy and her family were very happy. The young woman had managed to pass a test to enter a university in the United States. She was close to realizing her dream. But unfortunately, that dream would be taken from her and brutally. As the family celebrated, a man named Jaime Enrique Sade Cormane arrived at their home in a pickup truck accompanied by a young man named Victor Turian Quintero. Jaime was a businessman who was almost twice Nancy's age. He had known the young woman for some time and the two were dating. Jaime asked Nancy's parents for permission so he could go out with her that New Year's Eve. The young woman's parents agreed but asked him to take care of her and bring her back by 3 a.m. However, the hours passed and Nancy didn't return home as agreed. In the middle of the night, Martin, who had already gone to sleep with his family, woke up and noticed that the light on the stairs was still on. He found it odd, because as soon as Nancy got home and went to her bedroom, she was supposed to turn that light off. The young woman's father went to her room to check if she had arrived and just forgot to turn off the light. But upon entering the room, he saw that the bed was empty. Very worried, he decided to go out into the city in search of his daughter. He went through several clubs that Nancy used to go to, but he didn't find her in any of them. He then decided to go to Haim Isad's house in search of news about his daughter. It was January 1st, 1994, started in the worst way for the Master family. Upon arriving at the residence around 6 a.m., he was attended by Haim's mother who was cleaning the floor of what appeared to be blood. Martin asked what it was about and where his daughter was. Jaime's mother responded that Nancy had been in an accident and had been taken to the hospital. She also said that all the blood on the floor was the girl's. Martin was desperate and immediately went to the hospital Clinica del Caribe, which was where Nancy was. There, Martin met with Alberto Saade, Jaime's father, the man who had taken Nancy out of her house the night before. Alberto told the young woman's father that a tragedy had happened and that Nancy had tried to take her own life with a shot to the head. Martin cried desperately. He warned his wife and eldest son about what had happened and they quickly went to the hospital. For the family, it made no sense that the young woman had tried to take her own life. She was very happy and had just gone to university to study in the United States and fulfill her dream. They knew there was more to this story than was told. Nancy was hospitalized for eight days. During this period, she underwent some surgeries, and due to complications due to her serious injuries, she didn't resist and died. Martin Mestre later said that on the last day of his daughter's life, the doctors told him and the family that the young woman wouldn't survive. He then, along with his wife, entered the room where Nancy was hospitalized, and the two together began to sing a song called Daddy's Beautiful Girl, a song that they used to sing to the young woman since she was a little girl. Martin said that while they were singing, his daughter's heart began to stop, and he and his wife were at her side when she left. The loss of the young woman devastated family and friends who were hit by a feeling of sadness and confusion. None of Nancy's relatives or acquaintances believed the version given by Jaime Saad's family. As I said, 
For them, this version made no sense. An investigation was carried out by police, and forensic expertise carried out at the time found that the version given by the Saad family didn't match what they found. There were no traces of gunpowder on the right hand, which was on the same side of the temple as the gunshot wound, but on the contrary, there was gunpowder on the hand opposite the side of the temple on which the wound was. This indicated that someone tried to simulate that the young woman shot herself. On the body, several wounds were found on the arms, thighs and intimate parts, where male fluid from two different men had also been found. Also, there were skin remnants under Nancy's fingernails, which indicated that she had tried to defend herself against someone. After the police made it known to family members and the public that the Saan family lied and that Nancy was actually the victim of a crime, the news quickly spread throughout Colombia. The case was widely reported by the media at the time and ended up generating a great popular uprising. A few days later, Martin received an anonymous letter stating the alleged reason why his daughter was the victim of a crime. According to that letter, on New Year's Eve, Nancy would have caught Jaime in his room wearing makeup and dressed as a woman, having intimate relations with other people, including men. The young woman then got scared and ran from Jaime's house, but she was chased and caught by him and a few more men who were in the room. Officials at the hospital where Nancy was admitted said that she was taken there wrapped in a sheet and that under that sheet there was mud and some burrs stuck to it. This means that the Saad family and the other people who were there in the house even took the young woman to a forest area where they were going to abandon her, but for some reason, they changed their minds and decided to take her to the hospital. While all this was happening, Jaime Saad had evaporated and despite being searched in several places, no one was able to find him. On July 5, 1996, when he was considered a fugitive, Haim Saad was sentenced by the Colombian justice to 27 years in prison for the crimes against Nancy Mastry. Authorities couldn't find Haim Saad anywhere. Many believed he had left the country and fled to the United States. In April 1998, he was placed on Interpol's wanted red list. Despite the efforts of authorities in different countries to locate him, Haim was not found. He had hidden himself very well. Jaime comes from a wealthy family, and they certainly offered all the support and resources that helped him in his escape. With that, he could be anywhere on the planet, since for him, we can say that money was not an issue. Martin Mestre, Nancy's father, knew that with which passing day, the chances of finding Jaime were becoming more and more remote. He decided he wasn't going to sit idly by just waiting for the authorities to find him. As a reserve navy officer, Martin knew he would need to use his intelligence to find the man who took his daughter's life. He then proceeded to take various investigation-focused courses, from the most basic to the most advanced. Through these courses, Martin acquired a lot of knowledge and put it into practice with the intention of achieving what the authorities couldn't, locating Haim. As he had no idea where Haim Saad might be, and also had no clue as to his whereabouts, his only option was to get close to his family, and Martin obviously couldn't do it using his real identity. He approached Jaime's family through social media with four fake profiles he created. Two men and two women with Arabic surnames and from the Arakataka region of Colombia, where the Saad family came from, whose trust he gained. All this work would only bear fruit 26 years later. At the end of 2019, while checking open conversations on internet profiles of Jaime's relatives, Martin noticed that certain keywords began to appear. Among them, Samaria. Martin and two other men who helped him in the investigation thought that Samaria was about Santa Marta, a city on the coast of Colombia. They continued investigating and shortly after they discovered that in fact, Samaria was not the coastal city of Colombia, but Santa Maria, a neighborhood of the city of Belo Horizonte, capital of the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil. That's right, by all indications, Jaime Saad was hiding all this time in Brazil. After collecting various information that corroborated this theory, Martin Mestre forwarded it to Interpol. Interpol contacted the police in Brazil and passed on information regarding the profile of Jaime Saad. 
Brazilian agents then started looking for someone in the city of Belo Horizonte who matched this profile, and in January 2020, they found a man who used the name Enrique dos Santos Abdala. The agents began to monitor this man. They followed him for a while and managed to get a fingerprint of him through a glass he used in a bar. In possession of Enrique's fingerprint, the agents compared it to Jaime Saad's fingerprint and result was positive. Enrique dos Santos Abdala was actually Jaime Enrique Saad Cormane. Interpol agents were notified of this confirmation. They then set up an operation in conjunction with the Brazilian police to capture the fugitive. Jaime Saad was arrested and offered no resistance to the police. Martin Mestre was notified of the arrest of the man he had been looking for almost three decades. He said that upon receiving the news, he began to cry and then knelt down and thanked God. The news of Jaime's arrest reverberated in Brazil and Colombia. Many who followed the case were relieved to know that he was finally arrested after so many years. For the authorities, Jaime fled Colombia in 1994 straight to Brazil and not from country to country as some believed. In Brazil, Jaime managed to hide very well, and as I said, he probably had help from family members to support himself. In 1998, he assumed the false identity of Enrique dos Santos Abdala. The following year, in 1999, he obtained a driver's license that was renewed in 2014 and 2016. He even managed to open accounts in several banks. During this period, Jaime still got married, had two children, and opened a company. In the words of Martin Mestre, Jaime practically erased and rebuilt his life from scratch. The agents who helped capture the fugitive discovered that he led a life beyond suspicion, but found it strange that he had used his real name on his children's birth certificate. Something very unusual for someone who is hiding and doesn't want to draw attention. Another strange thing is the fact that he has been in a stable union since 1995 but only made it official in February 2020, almost a month after being arrested. According to sources, this marriage would kind of help him stay in Brazil, and he wouldn't be extradited to Colombia to answer for the crime he committed there. And in the declaration of stable union, as well as in the children's birth certificate, he used his real name. From the moment he was arrested, Jaime claimed innocence. He even wrote a letter where he said he was being wrongly accused and gave his version of the events that dawn. According to him, he and Nancy stayed in their room drinking heavily and doing drugs. At one point, the two saw that it was past the agreed time for the young woman to return home. Nancy was very worried about this, and Jaime told her he was going to take a quick shower, and then he would take her away. He then went to the bathroom to take a shower, and that's when he heard a gunshot. Startled, Jaime left the bathroom quickly to see what had happened. He said that at that moment, he found Nancy in bed with her head wound and a gun beside her. This letter reached the Colombian press, and needless to say, the victim's family and friends were outraged. For them, it wasn't enough for Jaime to have done what he did, and now he wanted to tarnish the young woman's image. Not to mention that this version given by Jaime doesn't match anything with what the forensic expertise found. And there is still the issue of his mother trying to clean up the crime scene, sort of get rid of the possible evidence that could put her son and others involved in jail. In that same letter, Jaime also wrote that when he fled Colombia, he went to a town in the interior of Amazonas called Tabatinga. He said that Nancy was still alive in the hospital while he was in the city and that when he heard the news of her passing, his world collapsed. However, Fernando Oliveira, Jaime's lawyer, gave a different version during an interview. The lawyer said that Jaime stayed in Colombia until the last day of Nancy's life, as he had hopes that she would wake up and actually tell them what had happened that morning, and as it didn't happen, he decided to flee to Brazil. Well, it looks like the two didn't exactly agree on what they're going to say before giving interviews and ended up getting complicated. You must be thinking how shocked his wife was to learn that the man she had been with for over 20 years wasn't who he claimed to be and that he was actually a fugitive with a name on the Interpol Red List, wanted by account of a serious crime committed in another country. Nothing to be worried about. She wasn't shocked at all, since she knew everything. Not only did she know, but she also gave an interview 
where she defended her husband and replicated his version of the facts on national television. The woman, who is Brazilian and whose name was not revealed, also said that after one year of relationship with Jaime, he told her everything and said that he was being unfairly accused of a crime that he didn't commit in Colombia. You see, sincerity is one of the pillars of a healthy relationship. No wonder they've been together for over 20 years. Martin Metro saw the interview of Jaime Sade's wife and said that the woman has every right to give her opinion, but that she has become blind over the years and that legally she is an accomplice to the crime, since she was aware that her husband was an outlaw accused of a serious crime. Martin also said that the woman had moral obligation to denounce her husband to the authorities and that if he really was innocent, he should have gone to Colombia and prove it. Jaime Saad was imprisoned for about 10 months at the Nelson Hungary Penitentiary Complex in the city of Contagion in Minas Gerais, where he awaited the court's decision. His extradition to Colombia seemed just a matter of time. However, the crime had already expired and the case was taken to the Federal Supreme Court, which would give the final decision whether Jaime Saad would be extradited or not. At the STF, Minister Carmen Lucia and Minister Hilmar Mendes voted in favor of the extradition of Jaime Saade, while Ministers Edson Fakin and Ricardo Leandowski voted against. The fifth minister, Celso de Mello, was on leave, and the law determines that in cases like this, the tie favored the defendant. Thus, Jaime Saade was released from prison and returned to live his life normally with his wife and two children. Currently, he is almost 60 years old and is free for the crime of ideological falsehood for having falsified documents while he was in Brazil. Nancy Mestre's family and friends were devastated by the decision of the STF. All the work and effort of years seemed to have been in vain. Martin Mestre said he would not give up trying to bring justice to his daughter. He and his family hired a team of international lawyers whose office is based in Washington, United States, and together with the family's Brazilian lawyers, they will continue to look for instruments to ensure that justice reaches Jaime Saade. Martin also wrote a letter to the SDF after learning of their decision not to extradite the defendant, but so far, he has not received a response. Well, what we have left is to wait and hope that justice is served, and any news regarding this case, I'll bring it here on the channel for you. And if I forget, you can send me a message so I can remember. As you know, age comes and the memory fails sometimes. Alright folks, that's it for today. Thanks for watching until the end, best wishes and I see you next time.